talk is Clive Truman, who's going to talk to us about respiration in meta in sorry mesopelagic fishes. Clive, over to you. Thanks very much. Let me just uh, get all this going. Come on. Ah. Spinny wheel of doom on the screen. Ah, can you all see that? Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you. Super. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and I will talk briefly now about um, some methods that we've been developing to uh, recover field respiration, field metabolism for uh, fishes, but particularly applied to mesopelagic fishes uh, and obviously here in the context of um, carbon flux. So this is work that's ongoing. Uh, it's largely been done, um, funded by the NERC Biocarbon Programme. Uh, and it's been done by myself and Jethro Redding, who's actually on a ship at the moment and is about to start a PhD when he comes back. So um, I apologize for getting anything wrong that I should, um, shouldn't do for him. Uh, and this is also work that we've been doing in collaboration with, particularly with Santiago Hernandez Leon and Aram Samiento in um, Gran Canaria. Okay, so. Um, in fishes, mesopelagic fishes certainly play a role in the transport of carbon from surface to deep oceans. But the magnitude of that role is really uncertain. And I would absolutely point you towards a fantastic talk in this series earlier this year from Helena McMonagall, which really sets the introduction as to um, what, he, what we do and don't know about the relative contribution of fishes to carbon flux in the open ocean, uh, and particularly um, setting out where our major uncertainties lie in, in, that, um, in, in constraining that term. But let us, for, for the sake of it, let's assume that fishes, they are an important component of the mesopelagic community, a significant amount of the total biomass, so certainly the total metazoan biomass in the mesopelagic is fish. Um, the total biomass is uncertain, and one of the main reasons it's uncertain is they're actually relatively difficult to systematically catch in nets and also have varying um, reflectance for acoustic um, uh, signals. And so constraining the total biomass of mesopelagic fish in any horizon at any depth is quite challenging. And so our estimates of biomass actually vary by more than an order of magnitude. And the principal uncertainty underpinning our um, estimates of fish contributions to carbon flux is the actual biomass. But on top of not knowing the complete biomass of mesopelagic fishes, we also have uncertainty related to exactly what their migration patterns are. I mean, how much time do they spend um, at different depths and what their metabolic or respiration rate is. And it's the metabolic respiration rate component of that, of this uncertainty that I'm, I'm going to talk about today. But given that um, most of us are not mesopelagic fish people, I um, should briefly explain um, that we have hundreds of, well, I'm not sure exactly how many hundreds, but there are hundreds of species of fishes in the global ocean that we would classify as mesopelagic. Um, but for the purposes of thinking about carbon flux, we can really break that down into two broad categories. We have um, fishes that conduct diurnal migration, that is, that migrate to the surface in night dark hours to feed, and then migrate back down to depths usually below um, 300 meters um, during the daytime. And that diurnal migration is essentially a predator avoidance strategy. But that diurnal migration, of course, creates an active carbon transport from surface to deeper waters. Uh, and then we have a second category of mesopelagic fishes that do not migrate, but remain in deeper waters. And we usually uh, are, are considering waters from four or 500 meters down to below a thousand meters for the non-migrating um, component of the mesopelagic fishes. So we can break down, that we're gonna sort of break the complexity of mesopelagic taxonomy into just migrators and non-migrators. 
broadly because those two groups have a very different role in terms of carbon flux. Migrators are going to be moving up and down, potentially actively transporting carbon from the surface into deeper waters. Um, Non-migrators are not actively transporting um, carbon to depth, but are important in remineralizing that carbon potentially below depths at which it's readily reventilated. Uh, the second point that uh, the reason that um, mesopelagic fishes are topical at the moment is that there is uh, increased interest in the potential for uh, mesopelagic fisheries, um, particularly mesopelagic fishes as a source of um, fish meal for aquaculture and potentially for other um, pharmaceuticals or nutraceuticals, but, but, but mainly fish meal sources. And the reason that um, people are exploring mesopelagic um, fisheries, again, um, largely is based on this large, potentially very large biomass of mesopelagic fishes that is um, recognized to be present. And if there's a large biomass, then potentially there's an economic resource. But the economic fishery depends on us understanding the, um, the life history, or, or rather managing a sustainable fishery, depends on understanding the life histories of these fishes, and life histories also depend on metabolic rates. Uh, and, and actually, if we want to determine whether a, a fishery is a sensible thing to do, then constraining the, um, the roles that these fishes play in ecosystems and their relative um, ecosystem value potentially in terms of carbon flux, is also critical for um, establishing a cost benefit um, before any kind of fishery is, is, is fully established, if it ever is. Okay, so we then, with that in mind, we, we really want to understand what the, the metabolic rate or respiration rates of mesopelagic fishes are. So how do we infer or quantify metabolic rates of fishes? Well, normally, um, the, the, the standard method for, measure, for estimating or quantifying metabolic rates of fishes is to put a fish inside some form of respirometry chamber, excuse me, uh, put a fish inside a respirometry chamber and uh, measure the absolute rate at which oxygen is removed from the chamber by that fish. Um, that's not easily practical for mesopelagic fishes. Um, they're incredibly fragile and do not respond well to be. Um, it's possible to trap fishes at depth with, um, particularly with some remote capture devices. However, the behavior of the fish inside a respiration chamber is likely not particularly um, representative of the behavior of that fish um, in the wild. So we can't very easily employ respirometry methods to quantify uh, metabolic rate of mesopelagic fishes, and certainly not for the, um, for the more fragile and non-migrating taxa. So we have two alternative methods. Um, the method that's most commonly applied Today it is called ETS, which is measuring the um, the activity of the um, transfer system in, employed in cellular respiration. The capacity of um, a tissue analyzed to generate um, to generate energy. This method requires calibration. Um, to spectrophotomic response of the um, analysis protocol to uh, oxygen consumption rates. And there's some debate as to how universal that calibration system might be. It's so not calibrated for every single species. The ETS method has the advantage that it is relatively simple to apply and it's retrospective. And uh, keep tissues at uh, stable temperatures, then the ETS method can be applied. Yeah. But as you say, the, the calibration between ETS data and 
oxygen consumption is uncertain. So we've been working on an alternative method to determine respiration rates, which actually applies to, to all teleost fishes. And this is based on the isotopic composition of, uh, of otoliths. I'll talk to you a little bit about otoliths in a second. Now, I'm gonna run through how this method works, but we have, we, fit, we have a number of advantages and some disadvantages that are associated with this method, which I'm, I'm gonna run you through. So firstly, what is an otolith? So an otolith is a calcium carbonate or aragonite structure in the fish ear, which functions uh, in, in hearing and in balance. The important point to us is that are acellular. Uh, they don't have a blood supply, they're not vascularized, uh, and they mineralize directly from a, a fluid in a, in a, in a, in a cell. It means that they cannot be regenerated after they're grown. Uh, so they contain an entire life history uh, of the fish. And so otoliths are really commonly used in fishery science to estimate the age of a fish. There's a herring otolith, and you can see the rings in that otolith that allow you to, es to estimate the age as you have fluctuating um, portions of the otolith that have more or less organic component together with the mineral. Um, otoliths are quite large. They're relatively easy to section, they're relatively easy to handle. And when we measure the, the isotopic composition of the carbon in the aragonite of an otolith, what's very well known is that the carbon is in isotopic DC disequilibrium with the surrounding water. Delta 13C value, carbon isotope value, of otolith aragonite is always lower. In other words, it's depleted in the heavy isotope of carbon relative to equilibrium. And that depletion um, of carbon isotopes or that depleted carbon isotope signal in otolith biominerals is assumed to represent the contribution of respiratory carbon um, included in the otolith. And this is very well recognized. Uh, it's also one of the main reasons that biominerals are poor carbonate um, throughout you know, history. However, um, carbon bi carbonate biominerals, poor records of um, dissolved inorganic carbonate, also means that we have a metabolic signal in the otolith. And very briefly, what's happening, and this is a simplification of the physiology of what's happening, but broadly, we have um, the DIC, bicarbonate in the external water, which has a carbon isotope value of approximately one to two per mil, depending on where in the ocean you are. Uh, and then we also have um, carbon released from respiration of diet. And diet is, uh, has a much um, lower proportion of the carbon-13 because of um, photosynthetic uh, fractionation uh, in favour of the light isotope. So carbon that's released by respiration of diet is, has much lower delta-13C values than carbon from the external water. These two sources mix in the blood. And because the proportion or the, the total carbonate concentration of the blood must be held constant to maintain um, carbonate balance and pH, in the organism means that effectively as the rate of production of respiratory carbon increases so the proportion of respiratory carbon in the blood translated into the otolith increases and because of the isotopic separation between these two um, carbon sources we can actually calculate the proportion of respiratory carbon present in the otolith from a simple mass balance if we know um, or can estimate the isotopic composition of the two end members in the system. There's a little bit more complexity to it than that, um, but broadly that explains why we have um, an isotopic measure of respiration, in other words the rate of production of respiratory carbon based on the carbon isotope composition of a biomineral. So broadly the higher the metabolic rate, the faster the production of respiratory carbon, the more metabolic carbon being incorporated into the otolith and the lower the otolith delta 13c value. Okay, so this value, this um, the proportion of respiratory carbon contained in the otolith, we term the C-resp uh, number, 
And this co-varies with a wide range of alternative metabolic proxies. And this has been known for a, a number of years. So for instance, um, co-varies strongly with the caudal aspect ratio, which is essentially a, a measure of metabolic um, activity across different fish morphologies based on hail shape. Basically things like tuna, oh, excuse me, things like tuna uh, have a very um, high caudal aspect ratio because they use the tail for swimming fast compared to things like you know, toadfish that have a very poor swimming capacity. Uh, sea rest values also um, co-vary well with um, metabolic enzyme activity, uh, with oxygen consumption, although this is a fairly sketch sketchy data set, uh, and also in experimental systems where um, temperature is used to experimentally manipulate um, respiration rates, then we see very strong covariances between um, thermally induced changes in metabolism and the proportion of respiratory carbon contained in the otolith. So we have a pretty good um, recognition uh, or, or and demonstration that the um, carbon isotope composition of the otolith or the C rest value is a strongly records um, relative metabolic rate, which converted into oxygen consumption rates from statistical calibrations. Uh, and we've also, we, we've explored this um, for a range of different species, over a hundred different uh, marine teleosts at the moment. We also have quite nice um, covariances between respirometry um, estimated routine metabolic rates of different fish species. And here the, the values estimated from respirometry are in the solid symbols and values from otolith, um, CRS, um, field metabolic rates inferred are in, are in the open symbols. Uh, co-varies with the um, respirometry routine metabolic rate, but is usually slightly higher than um, routine metabolic rate, which we would expect because routine metabolic rate is still what's measured in a respirometer uh, and there's limited um, activity potential of a fish in a respirometer, whereas when it's actually um, swimming in the wild, it can do much more um, energy consuming movements. So we would expect that the time integrated metabolic rate would be higher. So basically, we have lots of um, nice um, corroborating evidence to say that um, the CRS value is a valid proxy for the field metabolic rate expressed by a fish. OK, um, the actual value that we represent, or the way that we do this, is by drilling a small uh, amount of from the surface of the earth, and if we go through time, the earth will be integrating time in our signal. So the field metabolic rate is average for the amount of time that we all depends on the size of the otolith. So there's some experimenter uh, um, choice as to how much time you want to average, and also some constraints imposed by the, the size of the fish and size of the otolith. Tips that we have for from otolith sampling is at the same time as we measure the carbon isotope composition of the, of the carbonate in the aragonite, we also get the oxygen isotope composition, which we can use to infer the average temperature that the fish experienced over the same growth period that for which we're measuring or inferring metabolic rate. So we have an individual measure of temperature and the metabolic rate expressed at that temperature each individual fish. So this is really powerful for exploring thermology. Okay, so that quite long intro, I'll move back into metabolic fishes. So, so far we've explored or used this proxy to infer metabolic rates for around about 30 different species, magic fish and also into the Southern Ocean. And uh, I'm not gonna go down into the different species in detail, but we've got a good representation of both migrating and non-migrating taxa. I hope you get an idea of the size of, of some of these otoliths that Jethro has been working really hard um, sectioning and running. So I wanna run very quickly. Um, ETS based measurements of respiration have been applied to some of these same species. 
And here you can see, uh, in this case now uh, in solid is our Oatlith derived um, metabolic field metabolic rates, and in open symbols are ETS derived um, estimates of metabolic rates of the same species, but not the same individuals. In this case, um, two, two data sets. And hopefully you can see that the, uh, the, the variation between taxa containing these data sets is consistent across the two methods of measuring um, or estimating metabolic rates. Although ETS derived estimates of metabolic rate show much more variance than our otolith derived measurements. And here you can see, uh, here we're plotting ETS derived estimates of metabolism and otolith derived estimates for the same individuals with data sets um, from ourselves and Santiago's lab. And again, what we can see is that we, uh, at least for in this case, for uh, one of the migrating mctophids, the otolith um, estimates are very much in the middle of, of ETS-based measurements. But for a second species, our output measurements are somewhat below ETS-based measurements. We're not quite sure exactly why that is. However, the other thing we point out is that the range of values um, determined from ETS measurements are enormous, uh, more than an order of magnitude, maybe nearly two orders of magnitude variance in, in metabolic rates. And this is almost a different so the relatively low among individual variants recorded by the um, otolith method uh, and perhaps we have a um, higher precision partly because of the time integrated nature of the analysis Okay, so I'm going to move into what do metabolic, what do mesopelagic fishes really look like against metabolic rate for all 110 species of teleos fish in our data set so far, uh, and in purple are our mesopelagic fishes. So hopefully you can see broadly we have a, um, a fairly constant um, body mass scaling that the mesopelagic fishes describe a similar body mass scaling and metabolic rate to most other teleosts. Um, and if we zoom in to just the mesopelagic fishes, we actually have a fairly consistent um, allometric term for mass scaling of metabolism, which certainly helps in modeling studies. And we would, our, our mean mass scaling exponent for um, whole organism metabolic rate for mesopelagic fishes is about 0.93. Important point for that for modeling high allometric mass scaling that you might infer from simple um, metabolic theory. And I think that's consistent with estimates for a wide range of other fishes. Uh, and I think there's, there's strong evidence that um, the mass scaling of metabolism of fishes is, is definitely much higher than 0.75. And that's borne out by these, um, these, these measurements. But let's also point out that we have uh, Two different groups essentially of, of metabolic rates in these rep measurements. We've got the, the majority of taxa and then these taxa in green that, that sit some way below and I'm going to go into that in more detail now. So to really um, explore our metabolic rate data we're effectively doing a linear mixed effects model that more or less parameterizes uh, metabolic data in the form of a, a metabolic theory of ecology um, equation where effectively we're, we're asking well what component of metabolic rate is described by mass, what component is described by temperature, and what component is described by the physiology associated with different species. So um, the results of that um, mixed effects modeling shows broadly that mass has a, a fairly small impact on um, met um, among individual metabolic rates. And that's kind of what we expect given the relatively low um, mass scaling exponent of, of 0.93. So mass does not influence uh, metabolic rates measurements, but mass specific metabolic rate measurements very strongly. Temperature, on the other hand, is a very strong determinant of the metabolic rates that we're measuring. Uh, and so we can constrain thermal sensitivity of metabolic rate of these mesopelagic fishes with these kinds of terms. And across the data set, we would come up with a, a mean thermal 
pulse sensitivity of minus 0.8, which is a little bit higher than pulse sensitivity. In uh, and then we can look at the species effect term. And here we're just plotting all of the different species of pelagic fishes in the data set. Uh, and just plotted from lowest to highest relative metabolic rate. And hopefully, you can see fairly clearly, and as one would hope, um, the migratory fishes all almost all plot on the high relative metabolic rate and, and the non-migratory fishes are on the relatively low metabolic rate and which again gives us more confidence that we would certainly expect that to happen. Um, but I'd also point out that across these, these 30 different species of pelagic fishes, we recover more than an order of magnitude difference in has a very wide range. And one would not wish to um, assume a constant metabolic rate across different meters of pelagic fish. However, there's systematic variation that, that, that is possible to deal with. Um, so again, I point out the cyclothony genus, the bristle mouse. Now this is the genus that has the, the overwhelmingly dominates the non-migratory component of um, mesopelagic fishes. And it's the primary um, forms that most of the nighttime deep scattering layer across the global ocean. So this is a highly abundant and, and ecologically and biogeochemically relevant taxa. But I point out that that taxa has by far the lowest recovered um, metabolic rates. And this is actually borne out when we look at the um, recently. And here you're looking at gill arches, so the ventilatory surface um, of gill arches of different kinds of mesopelagic fishes. Here you've got migratory fishes and non migratory fishes. And what you can see is that there's these filaments that sit on the gill arches, and the filaments are the bits that the water is actually forced through to extract oxygen. So lots and lots of filaments. But when we look at cyclothony, you can see these filaments are completely degenerate. We can almost hardly see them. There's very little capacity to extract oxygen from this gill structure. Uh, so that sort of certainly um, supports our otolith-based assessments that cyclothony have very low metabolic rates. But really, um, encouragingly, we also find there's also a uh, closely to the non-migratory cyclothony. This is a sigmops, which actually is migratory. And you can see this um, phylogenetically related, but migratory um, fish, bristle mouth, actually does have well-expressed gills. So the gills are um, consistent with their migratory capacity and also with their um, metabolic rate, relatively high metabolic rate, as inferred from motoliths. Here you can see a uh, non-migratory hatchet fish, so not, uh, not a um, cyclothony, but a non-migratory fish. And again, the gill filaments are relatively well developed, even though it's a non-migratory fish. And here it plots on the top um, so, um, uh, collection and again it's it's separated away with higher metabolic rates than all of the cyclothony but relatively low metabolic rates in the entire data set consistent with its um, non-migratory status so we're really really comfortable that the oakless proxy is is um, accurately recording the um, relative metabolic rate um, differences between these taxa consistent with their morphology consistent with their ecology me. Well, one of the things that this means is that bristle mouths, that's the genus that's largely composed of cyclothony, they have very high biomass, but as we're identifying, they have very low respiration. Uh, and when we couple that with um, other evidence that their diets are increasingly dependent on detrital carbon and therefore not necessarily contributing to um, new um, capture of, of, of carbon, then the ecological role of bristle mouth in terms of carbon flux is likely to be relatively minor. And that is borne out with the um, estimates to date of bristle mouth's contribution to, um, to carbon flux. However, when we move back to the active migrating mesopelagic fishes, if we compare their metabolic levels to a range of more familiar and um, surface living fishes, then their metabolic rates are 
actually really pretty high. They're plotting in a similar field to things like mackerel and capelin. So these are active, you know, fully active pelagic fishes with high metabolic rates. And we shouldn't be surprised by that because these are small fishes that are conducting um, quite large sort of four, 500 meter um, vertical migrations every day uh, in relatively short periods of time. So uh, that they, they are active, fairly active swimmers. And that high metabolic rate, of course, means that their rate of consumption and their rate of um, transport of carbon is, is enhanced. I realise that I'm, I'm, I've not got much time, so I'm going to move quite quick to the last bit. Um, the, the last thing that we can easily um, explore with these kinds of data is the effect of temperature on metabolic rate across these different kinds of groups. And here I've just plotted the temperature. This is heinous inverse temperature. So uh, cold and warm. So um, what you can hopefully see clearly is that there's a different relationship between temperature and metabolism for migratory and non-migratory mesopelagic fishes. And in the migratory taxa, temperature is broadly uh, reflects the, the latitude. So here, these, are, these are largely polar Antarctic um, fishes. These are, are more temperate and more sort of, um, well, semi-tropical um, migratory taxa. And we have a fairly shallow um, effect of temperature on metabolism for these fishes. Whereas for the non Migratory, um, the cyclothony and other non-migratory species, we see a much steeper effect of temperature on metabolism. And here, um, temperature is broadly consistent with depth rather than latitude. And so we're fairly, fairly, um, I shouldn't say confident, we suspect that this uh, increased effect of temperature or apparent increased effect of temperature on the non-migratory fishes reflects the, the effect of depth rather than temperature, or at least included the temperature. So things like, for instance, um, low, lower nutrient quality and also the relaxed effect of, of non-visual um, predation on the requirement for, for metabolism. Okay, so to summarize all of that, um, our otolith data is telling us that we can actually um, estimate or describe metabolic rates in mesopelagic fishes using quite simple metabolic theory type equations, but that we need to apply uh, different terms for migrating and non-migrating taxa. So we have some sort of initial estimates of, of what we might, um, how we might parameterize those equations for migrators and non-migrators. Um, we also have some general sort of estimates for the that are um, constrained or described by those different groups. We suspect that thermal sensitivity is confounded by depth for the non-migrators, and we also suspect that the non-migrators have a, a, a rather reduced contribution to carbon flux, certainly compared to, to the migrators. Uh, and I think I've just actually said that, so uh, yeah. Um, the, and then the final point I think I make is that uh, the otolith method is actually remarkably um, consistent across taxa. It's proving to be a, a very reliable um, record of um, reflecting what we know about activity levels. Uh, and I think it's, it's a very tractable way of extracting metabolic rate data from otherwise quite inaccessible fishes. Uh, and at that, I will, I will finish. I know that I'm quite late. Excellent. Thank you very much, Clive. Uh, fascinating stuff uh, once again. Uh, so I, I think we've still got time for, you know, at, at least one quick question. If anybody would like to ask a question, you can either open the mic or put it into the chat. Um, let's see if anybody comes up. Let me just check the chat. Okay, I don't see anything at present. So an, an ignorant question for me. So given what you were saying about the the signature in the otoliths comes from the fact that primary production is doing fractionation in the first place, is it sensitive to the food source that the fish is consuming in terms of, you know, whether it's fresh phytoplankton or whether it's material which has been processed by other organisms? So uh, technically, yes, it is. 
Um, however, the proportion of respiratory carbon contained in the ocean is pretty low. It's for these fishes particularly, it's less than 10%, well, 10 to 20% of the total carbon is respiratory, which means that the, um, the sensitivity to the isotopic composition of diet is quite low. You have to have a really big isotopic difference in diet sources for that to be um, expressed in the otolith beyond measurement error. Um, to, cons but to constrain that, we also measure the isotopic composition of the muscle associated with each of our individual fishes because that constrain that essentially represents the, the, the diet that they're consuming. Uh, and across all of our 30 species, that hasn't varied by more than one per mil, at least in terms of the mean, the mean values per, per taxa. So I think we're, yeah, it, it will be hard to, to, to identify um, a strong effect of diet on, on these measurements. It's much more sensitive to the isotopic composition of DIC because that's 80 or 90% of the, of the otolith signal. But the advantage is that that's relative, um, relatively consistent and quite well modeled. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so I don't see any of the questions in the chat. As said, as before, if you have any questions, I'm sure Clive would be more than happy to answer them by email. Please do get in contact. Um, so then we're just going to yeah. wrap up saying thank you. I'll just put my email in the chat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk while you're doing that so people have a chance to see that. Um, so as I say, please do contact Clive if you've got any questions. Um, Otherwise, thank you very much to both of our speakers, um, two excellent talks, and we will be advertising the talks for the April call, which will be in the Pacific time zone soon, hopefully. Uh, otherwise, thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you.